Okay, so I think the audio is working now. Should be. Should be. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so let me just uh, post this 10 minutes assignment real quick. And we'll get ready to start our lesson. Uh, let me see. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, Actually, let me send out a final ping so people can join. All right, um, okay. So I guess we'll just wait a few minutes for people to join in. Um, let me send the attendance form as well. Yeah. So just uh, fill it out. Ooh, today is uh, more crowded than usual. Five people, interesting. <laughs> So just make sure to fill out that form, you know. I'll send it again if you need it. Um, so yeah. Mm, we'll wait until 4.50 and then, and then we'll start. And uh, remember, if you have any questions or anything like that, um, you can send it in Discord or you can just send it in chat here. So make sure to do that if you need to. Um, yeah. So. So, um, okay, I guess we'll start then. So, hello everybody, welcome to the 17th meeting this year. I'm already here. Um, well, so today we're just going to be covering the introduction to neural networks. Um, we're not really going to be doing uh, much coding, if at all, today because neural networks are a bit of a heavy, heavier topic than the other ones. and. It I felt like I felt that it would be more appropriate to spend a little more time specifically on neural networks and how those work. So um, yeah, let's start you know from the very beginning. This is a nervous tissue. This is what's found in your brain. This is where the neurons in your brain are found, and this is where you know all the processing in your brain occurs. I don't really know uh, uh, I don't really know enough about this to uh, give a more detailed explanation but neural networks as you can tell by the name are based heavily on how neurons work in real life in your brain so uh, uh, this concept was actually discovered a long time ago I think it was in the 40s, if I remember correctly, or somewhere, 40s or 60s. But um, back then, they only had enough power to do a few perceptrons at a time. So while it was 
a very interesting concept and as you can see today is a very useful concept it wasn't useful back then in practice because they didn't have nearly enough computing power that they needed to actually make a good use a good and efficient use of these uh, neural networks but you know as time progressed uh, whoa, whose law was that? that was Moore's law right where you know processors get twice as many transistors and then there yeah stuff like that so computers got more and more powerful and um, you know we got uh, computers got powerful enough where we could efficiently use neural networks so um, there's that so as you can see this is a model of a neuron in the brain so um, a lot of this stuff may look unfamiliar and that's fine we're not gonna be going over uh, all this all these key all these terms and what each of these are we're just gonna be going over three specific terms the nucleus the dendrites and the axons so well, I wrote it down here as well so uh, I erased everything else but here there the dendrites the nucleus and the axon so um, you might be thinking what this has to do specifically with neural networks but this ties in really well with what we're trying to learn so um, these concepts can be directly applied to the neural network model that we're gonna be learning about like I said yep Moore's law thank you <laughs> yeah I didn't see that yeah uh, I'll keep my eye on the chat but yeah thank you all right um so dendrites can be interpreted as the inputs into the uh, neuron where these are various inputs from other neurons that are coming here and then the nucleus is essentially what processes these processes these there we go <laughs> and finally the axon is the output where whatever process the nucleus determines the axon delivers that to other uh, neurons uh, see this is a very simplified explanation a lot of it's probably wrong but you know just bear with me <laughs> so um, now this can pretty easily be translated to the model that we're going to be using. So um, now you might be looking. At, oops, what do you? All right. Now, uh, as you can see, these are the inputs. So these would be the dendrites or the inputs. This is the neuron and nucleus. You know, same thing. Well, not the same thing, but in the same purpose. And this is the output or the axon. So we have all three of these in their basic form and this model right here. So um, now you might be thinking, what is this B1, X1, and W1? Now, um, as you can see here, these X1, uh, I, I'll just put this, is this a laser pointer? Should be a laser, okay, yeah, this is better. <laughs> so this X1, is the basic raw input right and um, that's just the data it's if this is your in I mean yeah that's the that's either gonna be the raw data or it's gonna be the output or uh, yeah just the raw output of another neuron so or actually um, while we're here you can also call these you can call these perceptrons or neurons um, Either one works, but just uh, just so you don't get confused if I accidentally call it perceptron instead of neuron sometime here. But yeah, see, so these are these are neurons or perceptrons, whichever one you like. Um, so yeah, these are the raw inputs for the neurons. Um, so they could either come from your data set or the output of another neuron. That's in a layer below that, but we'll cover that later. And we talked about this earlier, but um, sometimes actually not sometimes, a lot of times, the raw values in the data are not sufficient if you want a, an optimal and efficient algorithm. Um, so there was an example we talked about a long time ago where it was with linear regression and we were, we said, no, was it linear regression? Oh no, it was like uh, it was classifying different types of cancer with benign and malignant, and we said we want to eliminate as many false negatives as possible. Where we said uh, the cancer is not malignant, but it actually is. 
So that's the kind of bias. That's an example of bias, and this is what that B means. So um, B is the threshold that this X has to cross, essentially, to have an input, uh, to have an impact on the output, the final output. So um, let's say we made this B value negative 10. That means that if this X value, or you know, X times W, we'll get into that later, but if this X value is less than 10, then it's not gonna have any impact on the output uh, for specific activation points, which we'll go into later. This is uh, a lot of stuff we're getting into later, but bear with me. Um, this W function, uh, not the W function, this W variable is called the weight, where you multiply it with the input uh, like this. Um, so it's x times w plus b, where the w determines how much weight the, pretty self-explanatory, how much weight the inputs have. So this is a very basic form of an activation function, as you can see here. Uh, we'll definitely go over a lot more complicated ones uh, later on in this presentation, but this is a, you know, very basic form that allow you to understand what's going on and how everything works. So, um, here we have, as you can see, multiple neurons. So, we've we've got our neurons, which they're with their inputs and their outputs, and we have the same thing here. So these are, and as you can see, these neurons are positioned in various layers. So you might be thinking, uh, well, why layers? So, um. We usually, well, in more than usually, 99% of cases, you don't go immediately to the output layer. As in, this is not what happens usually. You don't have one or two, or I don't know, you don't have neurons that take the input and then immediately convert it to the output. There are usually layers of other neurons or perceptrons in the middle of those layers uh, between input and output. And the thing about these hidden layers is that it's pretty hard to figure out what exactly is going on with the values and such because um, the input layer, it, well, the input layer is pretty simple, right? This is the value, this is the raw data that you're giving the model. And it's pretty simple to see where this data, what, what's gonna happen to this data and how it's gonna be outputted. Same with the output layer. Um, at the end of everything, after all these hidden layers, this is only one, but you know the points still remain. Um, the output layer is just going to be the output of the function, which is pretty simple to analyze and look at. Yes, we know yeah. what those are. So we're the ones that are giving the input, so we know what the input is, and also oh, know, we're the one that what the output should be, so we know the output. But the yes, the hidden, hidden layers, layers are possible to tell. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, like Riley said it a bit better, but yeah. Um, yeah, we're the ones that are giving the input and we are getting the output so we know what those two are, but the, yeah, hidden layers is what's happening in between and especially, especially when you have multiple hidden layers, that becomes a lot harder to track and understand. So um, that's where, that's why a lot of people call like neural networks sort of black box you know you give the inputs it goes through a bunch of hidden layers and you get the output but that all that aside this is just a very basic model of a neural network and um, as you can see it can get way more complicated like this model um this is actually you might um, see the word deep neural networks I'm pretty sure I'm definitely sure you've heard the word deep learning or deep networks, or not deep networks, but you've probably heard the word term deep learning. And um, all that means is just a neural network with multiple hidden layers. Ah, that's, that's pretty much it. It's a lot less complicated than it seems. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, so that's how, what, well not how they work, we already covered how they work, but that's what deep neural networks really are. Um, so now, uh, if we go back here, remember this is the activation function that we're using. This is the function where all the inputs from here are inputted into the neuron and this converts them to their output. So we're taking these values and then we're using f of x to get our output. So um, this is the 
very basic activation function where it's x times w plus b is equal to z and z can be swapped for f of x it doesn't really matter z is easier because i don't want to write the whole thing out whenever i'm showing examples but um for this specific case um this is just a classification function apt activation function where if the input if x is greater or less than a specific threshold it doesn't need to be zero it'd be zero and it doesn't need to specifically be zero here but if it's less than this threshold it's going to output zero and if it's more than the threshold it's going to output one so that's pretty simple um but obviously this is not a well it is a pretty efficient function but it's not an accurate function i think that's the term where because say you had a really small difference between the threshold and your input now what's the difference between some value that's over here and some value that's way out on this side so there would be no difference which is one of the problems with this type of activation function in that the smaller differences and the points uh, distance from the threshold value are not taken into account whatsoever and it's just black and white zero and one which yeah um, which is why we have better activation functions better more efficient activation function functions to use for example this is the this is the sigmoid function right uh, wait yeah I I okay yeah good <laughs> I almost forgot the name, but yeah, this is the sigmoid function where we talked about this in our logistic regression um, lesson where this is a much better way of um, finding the two inputs and outputs and finding the threshold where um, instead of giving just a zero and a one, you give a value between them, but it's only... Yeah, so a value between zero and one, and then if it's greater than 0 0.5, you can say it's one, but you also have the, you know, I think a good term for it is the likelihood of it being one. I don't know. But say it's here, this is this is the less likelihood of being one than if the point is all the way over here. You see? So um, that's a much better activation function in terms of how much you can understand from the data. And this is the equation for it, pretty simple actually. And yeah, this is just a simple equation that most importantly is only between zero and one and does not include zero and one for its range. So um, yeah, these are also some other function, the activation functions that work. You know, um, you don't really need to know these. Uh, these are just some good examples. And then um, ooh, this is an important one. So. This is called the rectified linear unit. Uh, RELU. RELU? I don't know how you're supposed to say that. But um, this is a really important uh, activation function because we're going to be using this probably for a lot of our first examples. And this is a very efficient activation function as well, where um, it works pretty similarly. No, 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 not that one. Yeah, it's going to be in the next slide. But it it's, works pretty simply where it takes this value, um, the z is equal to wx plus b, and if this z is less than 0, that means that b, or, no, sorry. <laughs> if this z is less than 0, that means that it's automatically 0. That, that means that um, what I was talking about all the way over here with the bias term being a threshold that all these values need to overcome, it applies here, where if those this value of x and w doesn't overcome the bias term, for lack of a better way to say it, like just doesn't overcome it, that means that the value is negative, that means that it's just gonna give a zero as the output. And that's the strength of this uh, activation function. And of course, when it's uh, more than b, then it's just gonna be, you know, it's just going to be normal easy, you know. So, yeah. And there's a ton of a uh, ton of activation functions. I mean, we only covered a few of them. I the identity activation function. So that's just going to be f of x is equal to x. 
binary step we also just covered that um, logistic we also covered that 10h you know yeah, it keeps going Oof, there's a ton of them and we really um, at the beginning we're just gonna be covering really we're, we're just gonna be working with really we're, we're probably gonna cover all these later but that's the main one we're gonna be working with um yeah so now let's talk about multi-class situations um yeah uh let me see okay let me get my notes on that. okay yeah so there's two types of uh classes that you can have with a neural network and two types of you know identifications or you know what I mean two types of classes you can have with a neural network so the first type is a non-exclusive class where a data point or a neuron or yeah a data point they're gonna input to the neural network can have multiple classes or categories attached to it so I you probably have seen uh, videos of like those object detection algorithms where they take a photo and they find various parts of the photo and they categorize them so right here they would say this is a car this is a tree this is a road this is a stop sign this is a I don't know what sign this is a random sign another tree another tree house etc so um, this is uh, those are examples of non-exclusive classes so as you can see photos have multiple classes such as car street or city yeah um, now, on the other side of the spectrum, you got mutually exclusive classes. A data point can only have one class or category attached to it. So, for example, you have uh, photos being categorized as grayscale or with color, since um, you really can't have a middle ground. Uh, there's also a more famous example where you're, you have an algorithm that's trying to divide the difference between a dog and a cat. So, whenever it's inputted a f uh, photo to use, it only outputs uh, one answer and that happens to be whether it's a dog or a cat it doesn't it doesn't output any anything else that's the only you know that's the only class or category it's outputting yeah so um yeah, this is basic this is these are the real uh basics of neural networks um so we can go through some simple examples, I guess. Um, though I don't think you can really do it with this, but um, hmm. we can open up Jupyter Notebook really quick. Uh, are you just gonna use the MNIST dataset? Um. No, I was gonna go like through different activation functions. I'm not gonna use TensorFlow or anything like that. Not yet. Um, yeah, that that one's for next time. Remind me later. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, so now, oh, it's taking a while. <laughs> Okay. Give it a second. Uh, all right. Mm. So now I'll just make a new uh, folder for this. Um, I'll call it meeting seventeen real quick. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. We already went through, you know, um, yeah, so we already went through everything. Now, let's just say we had a two input neuron where it was a neuron like we went over here. Um, it's a neuron with two inputs. So let's say this is our neuron w is equal to one, two. Uh, that's the correct syntax. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, and then we could say the bias is equal to 4. Great. And then, and, all right, we can do that. So, yeah, so this would be 
the inputs for our activation coefficient. Okay, and then um, we already went over, so um, we can say x is equal to three, four. So um, w plus. So what we're trying to figure out is w times x plus b, right? So this is a comment, so obviously it's not going to be true. But um, we could just use parentheses and such. So we could say w of 0 times x of 0, and then use plus w of, oh. no, no, I don't think we need parentheses for these. W of one times X of one. And then plus B. So as you can see, that outputs uh, 15. So 15 is going to be the um, value we get. And this is the value we're going to be inputting into our sigmoid function. So this is the value for F. And um, let's go back to the equation for our sigmoid function. For This is the function we're going to be using, for example. So we could say 1 over, oops, that's my bad, um, 1 plus, oh, you can see the Jupyter notebook, right? Okay, that's good. Um, how do you do E again? Wait. Import math and do math dot e. Oh, I gotta do that All right. Um. All right. Nah. Okay, okay, okay. So one over that'd be one plus math dot. I think it's exp and then we can say let's call this y I think okay. negative y is that it no that's not right wait I forgot your one my wait what would you say I forgot your parentheses oh okay that's that's a good point that's a good point um there we go. Yeah, so that's the output of our uh, sigmoid function. So um, we can see that this neuron, the output of this neuron is going to be a 1. It's going to go up to 1. Um, yeah, so we're not really going to do much coding today. I didn't really prepare much, sadly, for the coding portion of today. Yeah, so mostly we're going to be covering how to import TensorFlow and use that in next in the next lesson so this lesson was just to go over you know how neural networks worked and uh, what they're all about so um, let's just review what we went over today so you know neural networks are a concept based on you know, natural discoveries of the body and how the brain works and how these are neurons so essentially neuron boils down to a input uh, processing and an output and we can use the same thing for our neurals networks where we get an input that is changed up with a weight and a bias and we process that all those inputs and we output all those and this processing here is done with an activation function so um, neural networks are arranged in various ways where we have various layers of inputs and outputs so Sometimes the input doesn't directly lead to an output and you have a hidden layer in the middle or multiple hidden layers like so and You have different act like we said before you have different activation functions like just the Standard binary one and this isn't the right equation for that. I don't think but um, Then you have the sigmoid function then you have all these other types of activation functions then you have the rectified linear unit which is one we're going to be working with a lot more than the others 
for now. Um, yeah, and then you have all these. So all these functions are what's going on in the neuron when it processes these, uh, all these things into the output. Yeah, so um, then we have multiple classes. So here we have a photo with uh, uh, multiple classes in the photo, such as like cars, streets, trees, houses, signs, up signs, telephone poles, whatever, you know, that sort of thing. And then um, you have mutually exclusive classes where a data point, yeah, uh, so it's only one class or category per data point, like you can see here with a grayscale or color photo, or maybe another example where it's, um, what was I saying before? Oh yeah, you, it, the algorithm's choosing between whether uh, it's a dog or a cat or something like that. So yeah. Um, mm, let me see. So yeah, that's about what we covered today. And yeah. So next, uh, yeah. next time probably we'll, we'll cover some more stuff about how neural networks work, and then we'll mm -hmm. uh, try and get some codes, and we'll actually implement the neural network. Uh, we're probably going to do something like character recognition, or uh, it'll be able to uh, classify images of clothing or uh, characters. Um, then after that, so what we have planned is uh, we're going to cover these things called. CNNs or convolutional neural networks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're more used for images. They basically allow you to get special features out of the image and that into the neural network. Um, then we'll do be doing RNNs, uh, recurrent neural networks. Those will allow you to um, look at time sensitive data. So you have uh, stocks. You want to be able to predict the stocks. Then it's something that goes over changes over time. So you repeat it through a recurrent neural network. But we'll go over all of that. Uh, also, we're going to learn about a few things. There are also one uh, fun uh, thing, or one, um, I guess, uh, practical thing more is uh, we're going to learn transfer learning. Um, so, if you want to, like, that's really the way that you should go if you want to build a neural network because uh, building it from scratch usually isn't that great of an idea. Uh, so, there's like uh, giant universities and companies that have already built very powerful neural networks. Uh, and they've trained them for like thousands of hours uh, using really powerful computers. Um, so you can basically use their model and fit them to your data. So that's a much more efficient way of uh, developing a neural network for, your, for whatever applications you have. So we're going to show you that. Um, also, uh, let's see. Uh, I, think I think that's, that's it. it. I don't think we go past transfer learning, do we? Uh, we might. We might uh, add a few. We might do some more stuff by add or. Um, We'll probably show you how to optimize and different methods for uh, optimizing neural networks, um, uh, the, the architecture of your network to try and make it more accurate or to have it look faster. Yeah, maybe we can we can cover that maybe because I don't think we have enough time in the school year, right? Because of AP tests as well. Kind of, we'll probably try and uh, fit it in with some of the other lessons. We'll see what. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah that's 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 it for the lesson. That's about our roadmap for next time. That's good. So thanks for whoever joined and uh, yeah thanks. See ya.